Hi, I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Melissa Parrish. Your co host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by Vice President and Principal Analyst Brandon Purcell to discuss the anatomy of decision making. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks for having me. So, Brandon, despite all of the technology and data at our fingertips, we still see a lot of bad decisions being made by businesses today. Why is that? Well, it runs contrary to belief that after all of this investment in data and analytics and AI, humans would still make bad decisions and humans and machines would make bad decisions. But unfortunately, we do. And that's because we haven't taken the time to actually codify what our decision making process is and should be. There is an actual framework, and this is nothing new for decision making that companies should go through when they're making strategic decisions, as well as tactical decisions. And that's what I'm hoping to introduce uh, to folks in this research and give them some best practices at every stage along the way. So these are this uh, framework, this conversation we're going to have is really applicable to kind of everyone, regardless of where they are in the spectrum in terms of technology and big data or little data and that kind of thing. Yeah, sure is. And also businesses and you and me, I mean, human beings as well. We all make decisions every day. And um, I know personally, I'm not the best decision maker in the world, so I could use some help too. And, you know, AI is obviously a super hot topic right now. I think there is this assumption that it will sort of solve all of the ills for many things, including perhaps decision making. But I feel like you alluded to this, right? Like machines aren't really guaranteeing that the best decision will be made across the board. Is that fair? I think that there's this myth overall in in business that I certainly hear um, that AI is is actually going to be making decisions. And in some cases it is, but in most cases it's not. What AI is really good at and has been good at for some time is taking a lot of data or noise and finding the signal in that so that you have better information, information that you and I could comprehend to make better decisions. So AI is not even in fully automated systems like in credit determination where you have maybe you have a machine learning model that's determining somebody's risk. Well, determining the threshold that you set upon that risk score for determining whether or not to give that person a loan, that's set by a human being. And that's going to continue to be the, the case in the future. And so, yeah, we can avail ourselves of all of these new tools and technology to synthesize information in a better way. But as human beings, we're still going to play the deciding role and then also measuring the impact of decisions over time so that we can figure out, was it the right decision or not? Or do we need to change it? So before we get into what your actual framework looks like, something just uh, occurred to me because we've all been using, when we talk about decision making, we use value judgments, right? In the, the language that we use, what are the right decisions? How do we make good decisions? How do we make better decisions? And I feel like that maybe gives us a little bit of a clue, right? Because better meaning what? Who decides what good looks like? That's got to be down to the humans, right? Unless you have defined that, which would necessarily rely on humans defining that as a piece of context for the machines. Yeah, well, it's very true. I mean, it, to, defining that is ultimately a human procedure at this point. And that's really in the first phase of this decision making process, you're framing the decision. And when you frame the decision, you have to define what good looks like. What is the outcome that you're actually driving towards with the decision? That's going to impact the rest of the decision making process. And defining that is you know, people think that it's a CEO sitting in a room defining what good looks like, but it's not. It's usually made in a collaborative way uh, across multiple meetings and multiple teams and stakeholders who are figuring out, OK, what is you know, what does good look like and what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve? So I think maybe now is a good time, Brandon, to kind of walk through what is the process that you're establishing through your research around an anatomy of a decision? Yeah, well, the first phase, like I said, is framing the decision. Um, so deciding what that outcome is going to be. And here as well, there is complexity in decision making. 
You know, it's very rare that you have a single decision that exists within a vacuum. What I found in my research is that macro decisions, big decisions like, let's say, where should we build a nuclear power plant? There are a lot of micro decisions that go into making that decision. So mapping out this de decision network is incredibly important. And here, companies can start to take a page from banks because banks have been doing this for a long time. As a matter of fact, many of the banks I've spoken to have actually developed a center of excellence in decision dissection. And they create these decision requirements diagrams that have, you know, essentially a series of nodes. Some are input, some are output, some are knowledge that ultimately lead to a series of decisions. So that's the first stage, really understanding the broader decision in the context of all of the micro decisions that are going to uh, come into play. The next piece, and this is where, of course, data and analytics can really help, is gathering information. So how do we gather all of the right information to make this decision? What data do we have on hand? What data do we need to go out and collect? And this is where you really need to go out and make sure that your knowledge is up to date. So if machine learning is contributing data, again, it's not making the decision, it's taking a lot of data and synthesizing that into a useful signal. Well, you want to make sure that that machine learning model is up to date, that it hasn't drifted, etc. And sometimes you might go out and do qualitative research to drive the decision as well. You want to make sure that you're not um, subjecting yourself to survey bias or sampling bias when you're doing that um, so that that signal is as, as pure as it possibly can be. So the next thing that you need to do is to identify the alternatives. And these may emerge when you're gathering information. Uh, but it's important to understand what your options are and what type of decision this is. You know, of course, there are binary decisions, go or no go. There are decisions that have multiple options. And then I think it's really important to realize that there are decisions that actually have infinite options. You know, I, I also cover customer analytics at Forrester and for a long time, content has been a bottleneck in personalization. But of course, with generative AI today, the ability to generate content on the fly that's specific to that customer in that moment, well, now the options for personal deciding what content to deliver are indeed infinite. So it's good to understand the universe, or you have to understand the universe of potential options. And then once you have those options, you need to start to weigh the evidence. So which of these options look good? And this is where you turn back to the, uh, the criteria that you created at the outset when you were framing the decision, specifically when you're talking about machine learning and propensity models. I was talking to Pegasystems and they help their clients automate a lot of these decisions based on predictive outputs. Um, so the output of a machine learning model is a propensity. Um, so you want to use that. You also want to use the value of that decision. So if it's the likelihood that a customer is going to buy something, um, you multiply it by the profitability or the margin from that purchase. And then what I think is interesting and I think is a best practice that companies um, uh, should adopt is having this lever or fudge factor that actually allows a human being to put their thumb on the scale and weight the decision based upon your company strategy, your own priorities. So this isn't just a mathematical expected return formula. There is a human element to it as well, because our intuition is this is why we're in our jobs, right? And it can help us to make sure that these decisions aren't just automated blindly, that they're actually moving in lockstep uh, with our strategy. Of course, once you do that, then you have to choose. All right, what is the best decision to make? And here, there are a lot of different uh, techniques that you can use. I mean, there's uh, scenario planning. And a couple of years ago, I gave a keynote on different game theory techniques to use for making decisions in the face of uncertainty. There's uh, simulation. And with the, um, the rise of generative AI and the ability to create synthetic data, I believe more and more companies are going to be creating um, digital twins of their customer base and simulating different interventions to see which one yields the best results. And then there are very technical ways of doing this on the fly, like reinforcement learning and, and contextual bandits that are continuously testing and, and finding what the optimal decision is and placing more bets in that direction. Now, one of the biggest problems with more strategic decision making is that ultimately the decisions are made in a meeting. 
And we say we want to be data and insights driven, but how many times do you actually have all of the data and insights at your fingertips in a meeting? Our colleague JP Gounder brought up the fact that unfortunately, meetings actually mar effective decision making because people come equipped with some insights, but ultimately other questions come up and it would take too long to chase down the answers. What I think and hope from this generative AI moment that we're all in is that asking those questions and getting the answers in real time uh, becomes easier as more and more business intelligence tools adopt natural language interfaces. Now, let me say, caveat that with garbage in, garbage out is still applicable. And so if you haven't done your data due diligence, if your data is unhygienic, then you're going to get bad answers. So generative AI isn't going to solve anybody's data challenges, but it will make good data or bad data more accessible. Finally, once you've decided, uh, you need to take action. And this is where the space gets really interesting to me because for some decisions, a human being is going to be taking action. And on the other end of that spectrum, you have decisions that will be entirely automated. But like I just said, it is a spectrum between human beings and robots. On the one hand, large strategic decisions where you don't really know what the right answer is. Where should we build a nuclear power plant? As I mentioned before, human beings are going to be making that decision. On the other end, what product should we recommend? Well, today it's mostly computers that are making that decision. Um, somewhere in the middle, you might have inventory planning, where in the beginning, human beings are making those decisions, but then they get comfortable working side by side with robots, and it moves more towards a human in the loop scenario, where machines are powering most of the decisions with human oversight. What determines where your decision falls on this scale of human versus automated is based on three different factors. One is the scale of the decision. If the decision is at a scale that you don't have enough human beings to make, of course, you need to automate it. But that's only a small piece of the puzzle. There's also the risk of a bad decision. If it is a risky decision, if there could be negative consequences from the wrong decision, you should probably have a human make it or have a human in the loop. The third piece of the function, though, is the biggest piece, and that is certainty. The more certain you are in a decision, the more uh, likely you are to automate it. If there is a high degree of uncertainty, you want a human being involved in the decision-making process. And in terms of those three different pieces, risk, scale, and certainty, certainty has an exponential impact on the likelihood to automate. Finally, once you've made this decision, then you need to review it. Are you meeting the outcomes that you intended or are you not? I talked to one bank in particular that was using new models to make crediting decisions, uh, predictive models, and they measured the results. And they actually weren't seeing the results that they had predicted. Um, so they investigated and they looked at, at the override. So when human beings were actually looking at the model's recommendation and then overriding it and making their own decision, and overrides had gone way up because the machine was recommending a decision that they wouldn't have made in the past. And this was resulting in actually bad decisions. So there's a whole change management piece to this as well. I have a question for you, Brandon, about the review part specifically. I feel like this is something that is maybe more driven by instinct than anything else, but maybe I'm wrong. The question is this, how do you know when to feed your results back into the machine? to affect its later decisioning, right? Like in a media buying scenario, so much of this is automated right now. You put the what you want to spend and the return that you're looking for, the results that you're looking for, the machine does all of it and adjusts on the fly based on what you've told it. But if I'm making a strategic decision, one of these things that's harder to figure out, in the review step, do I feed back in the kinds of insights that you just discovered so that the algorithm knows, okay, in this company, we are likely to see human override happen this often. And so I should change my robotic um, recommendations in this way to account for that review. Yeah, it's a really good question, Melissa, and it depends on two factors. One is the cadence with which you're able to uh, capture that metric. And so in this particular example of credit determination, you know that each time one of those decisions is made, that becomes data that is then streamed into a BI tool. So you can, you can see it in near real time. 
But the other one is um, is around how easy is it to reverse the decision or change the decision, accept the things we cannot change. You built that nuclear power plant, that's going to be there, right? I mean, I guess you could shut it down and that's happened. But for a lot of decisions, once you've made it, there's no going back. So, Brandon, we've talked about using this framework for strategic decisions and maybe like at what altitude are you guiding clients like use this framework in these types of decisions? Is it all sort of like how would you roll this out with a client or how would a client roll this out to their organization? Is this more like a pressure test moment? Make sure you're kind of doing these things when you're making strategic decisions or what? Yeah, I would say the whole reason for this research is because the health of an organization is the result of the health of its decisions. And so whether that's strategic decisions or tactical decisions, if you're not following this process, if you're not asking the right questions along the way, there's a good chance you're not making the right decisions. And so to answer your question, I would apply this to both strategic and tactical decisions. It's going to look a little bit different in those two cases. Um, it's easy to see how you could apply it to these strategic decisions like, you know, should we launch this product? Should we enter this market where you have a little bit more time? There's more human involvement. There's probably less data available to make those decisions. On the other hand, with more tactical decisions, I think it's also important to apply this framework because What's happening today is a lot of companies are automating decisions that are tactical, using some status quo threshold for those decisions. And um, if you're not using this framework, you're likely to be leaving money on the table. Maybe you are denying applicants who probably should be approved. And you know, given all the advances in our ability to collect data, analyze it, and make decisions at scale on it, we should be rethinking these thresholds, these deciders um, that we've had in the past. And um, this framework is a good way to do that. Are there particular steps along the seven step path where you feel like technology is crucial and indispensable versus a nice to have? And also the opposite. Are there places where in your research you've seen that the human thumb on the scale, as you put it, is more necessary or this is the moment where you want to really lean on that human ingenuity and creativity? Yeah, well, the good news, Melissa, for folks suffering from FOLO, which is a Kevin Roos of the New York Times term uh, that means fear of looming obsolescence, is that human beings will continue to be relevant across this process. But to your point, there are moments in the decision making process where humans play a crucial role framing the decision. That is and will continue to be in the short and near term, at least a uniquely human role. Human beings will decide what the decision is that they need to make, what that outcome is, meet with stakeholders, gather requirements, all of that is, is uh, human led. Gathering information on the other hand, I mean, that is where technology plays a pivotal role already. Capturing data, analyzing that data, creating insights. In the world of Gen AI, I foresee companies using Gen AI to gather qualitative information as well by conversing with customers to get their feedback on what a potential product launch um, should look like, for example. Um, so there's going to be technology there, but humans will still be at the reins. Uh, in terms of identifying alternatives, this is a place where human beings will play a role as well. What are the possible alternatives given your current processes and internal policies? In terms of weighing the evidence, I mean, it depends on the type of decision here, but this is a place where um, for tactical decisions where there's a lot of data, like I mentioned before, there are certain equations that you can use to try to weigh different decisions. And if you're confident in the data and you're confident in your analysis, that's a great way to go about it. But where there's a paucity of data, human beings are probably going to be putting more of their thumb on that scale to ultimately make the choice. And this is the piece that is and should continue to be human-led, um, choosing among alternatives. Um, so even when decisions are automated, I don't mean that there's always going to be a human being there saying, okay, you know, recommend this product to Melissa. No, of course, that will be automated, but a human being will still have been, will still be setting what the overall optimization metric is and therefore controlling that choice. 
taking action. This is where a lot can be automated today and should be. Now, that being said, there are definitely decisions where you want a human being to take action, even decisions that could potentially be automated. I mean, think about a, um, you know, a severe diagnosis. It could actually be an artificial intelligence system that's making that diagnosis, but communicating that to the patient in a way that has empathy and compassion, we need a human being uh, to do that. And then um, reviewing the decision, um, certainly uh, we will use, we will instrument ways of measuring the efficacy of decisions, but human oversight will determine, okay, when do we actually need to uh, change course? So Brandon, this is all making me think of a research project that you and me and Shri started working on. I think it was like six and a half or seven years ago. And we abandoned because at the time it was technically too difficult. And if you recall, the idea was how do we have enough data and technology and decision-making power to figure out when to stop doing things? So we were looking at this idea of predicting when something that was currently working would stop working. Uh, ironically, I think about what's happened in the world in the intervening time, and I think, well, I'm really glad we didn't write that report before 2020 because it would be totally inapplicable now. But I wonder if the research that you're doing and adding into it the context of chat GPT, generative AI, all these sorts of technologies that are getting us closer to true predictions gets us a little bit closer to being able to do something like that. Like this product is succeeding right now, but based on the models and the machine learning and what we're looking at in the future, it's likely to fail in three years. So now we need to start planning to deprecate in the future. Can we do that research now? Yeah, we probably could do it. I mean, it would definitely be fall into the more like emerging type of research that we do as opposed to codify best practices. But yeah, I think that we probably could. It just feels like the natural outgrowth of the decision-making process that you've just mapped out, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. And it gets back to your previous question about, okay, like how often should you be measuring these things? And if you're able to have, if you have enough data about, let's say, past product launches, and you're able to use that data in a predictive model to predict the likelihood that a product will fail at a certain point, it's almost like a churn model for a product. Like, okay, when is the fall off going to happen from this product during which period, which you would do with your customer base? And if you have some certainty around that, well, then you can start spinning up the next version of that product in time and replace the product. That's interesting. It's like you can use generative AI and your decision-making framework to forestall having to make other difficult decisions, right? Because you can see things happen before they do. Yeah, that's true. And that actually, so that that will impact how you're framing the decision. Most companies today are looking at an immediate decision, but then actually expanding that framing, that graph of the decision network into the future and what are the once if we launch this product, what are the decisions we'll have to make down the line about this product that can help you to foresee this moment where you're going to have to make another decision and actually forestall it, as you said. What is that relationship between human and machine and decision making moving forward and in the future? Like it's part and parcel or we're doing this together. It's not one taking over. Yeah. I mean, I would just say that to his question about the risks, the risk is that companies say, okay, we're going to use this, you know, in our meetings to make these decisions without data and analytics. And then there's also a risk on the other side that people say, okay, we're just going to automate, try to automate everything. So to wrap, Brandon, I think it's always interesting to kind of explore, you know, what are the risks or things that you are advising clients against when they're thinking about implementing such a structured way of decision making? Yeah, well, I think as humans, we have a bias towards wanting to make decisions ourselves and and make this process completely human driven and leave out data because you know, we have strong intuitions and gut feelings about what we should do. And, you know, we even have data at Forrester about that. I think less than half of organizations are using data to make their decisions. And clearly that's that's a problem. So you do need to incorporate the machines. This can't be just a uniquely human process where all sorts of human biases and, and flaws are going to come into play. On the other hand, although everybody is so enamored of generative AI and AI in general, 
you can't just rely on the machines to make the decision. Humans are going to continue to play a pivotal role. So finding the right balance for your organization, where you're at in your maturity, and for the context of the decision between human and machines working together as a team, that is the critical piece. Otherwise, you're at risk of you know automation problems on one side or human bias and flaws on the other. Excellent. Well, I know you'll be on stage at our forthcoming tech events in later this year. So we look forward to uh, seeing you then. Yeah, please come and help me dissect the anatomy of a decision. I hope to see you there. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. If you like what you heard today, please be sure to check out our upcoming technology forum starting in September. To learn more, visit for.com slash tech events. That's F-O-R-R dot com slash tech events. Thanks for listening.